Hello everyone, welcome back. This is the second section of chapter one. In this section, we'll talk about the history and importance of intercultural communication. As we mentioned, intercultural communication is not a brand new thing. We have many famous cases of intercultural communication in ancient times. Can you think of any in history? Yes, the Silk Road, Zhang Qian, Jian Zhen, Xuanzang, Zheng He, Marco Polo, etc. These are all cases of communication between people from different cultures. Take Silk Road in Chinese history, for example. People in Asia, Africa, and Europe interacted with each other through the road. The Silk Road was an ancient network of trade routes, formally established during the Han Dynasty of China, which linked the regions of the Asian world in commerce. Do you know who opened up the ancient Silk Road in Chinese history? Yes, Zhang Qian. Do you know who was a famous master of Buddhism in the Tang Dynasty? That's Jian Zhen. He lived in the 688 to 763 period. His sailing to Japan was regarded as a great event in both the Chinese and the world's Buddhism history. Do you know who has stayed in India for 16 years? That's Xuanzang. He was the 17th century Chinese scholar monk. He traveled in Central Asia and India. During his stay in India, he studied and visited all the important Buddhist sites and ruins. Enjoyed great popularity in India through his learning as an outstanding Buddhist scholar. He had won the support of the reigning monarchs in India. Another amazing man was Zheng He. Between 1405 and 1433, he led seven sea ships to different parts of the world. He certainly traveled to India, Africa, and the Middle East. Some people insist that his ships may have been reached South Africa and Australia. Marco Polo was an Italian merchant. He has journeyed across Asia at the height of the Mongol Empire. As a social phenomena, the history of human beings is also the history of intercultural communication. As intercultural communication exists there, as long as there is a communication between individuals with different cultures. As a newly developed discipline, intercultural communication started in America in 1960s. Edward T. Hall, a famous anthropologist, is considered as the father of intercultural communication. He published his books, The Silent Language, in 1959. He expanded the relationship between culture and language, as well as nonverbal communication. In the 1960s, communication scholars mainly focused on the conceptualization of the field. From then on, intercultural communication has been developing more and more rapidly, with a lot of books and periodicals published. Edmund Leach's book is designed for the use of teaching undergraduates in anthropology, linguistics, literary studies, philosophy, and related disciplines faced with structuralism argument. An introduction to intercultural communication was written by Fred E. Gent. Fred E. Gent was born of second-generation German immigrants. He came from the multicultural South Central region of Texas. After graduation, he received his doctoral degree in communication from Bowling Green State University. He has taught and been a student of intercultural communication for more than 40 years, developing his experience through travel and international training and research projects. Meanwhile, Intercultural communication has become compulsory or optional subjects in many of the U.S. universities, 
and colleges. The history of intercultural communication in China is comparatively shorter. Many foreign language teachers, linguistics, psychologists, and people engaged in management are interested in this field. And their study focuses on the following aspects. The relationship between language and culture, nonverbal communication, comparison between Chinese and Western customers and traditions, comparison between business management in China and Western countries, and so on. So why do we need to study intercultural communication? It is often thought that people can communicate effectively if they have mastered the basic communication skills in a foreign language. However, it is not the case. Quite often, when polite behavior in a culture may be considered impolite or even rude in another one. Now, please watch the video, Never Do These Things in Foreign Countries for 5 Minutes, and then answer the following questions. How many countries are mentioned in this video? What are their customers and taboos? Do these things in foreign countries. So many countries, so many customs. Any jet setter will agree this good old proverb is true. In the age of globalization, going places has become an essential part of our life. We are all well aware of the fact that while visiting a foreign country, we must obey certain local traditions and common rules. Failing to do so has given a rich ground for many jokes. If you don't want to be in one of those, or better yet, featured on YouTube as that crazy tourist, fine, or even arrested, pay attention to our list of do's and don'ts accurate in different countries of the world. Russia the mysterious Russian soul has a lot of dark corners, and it might take years to discover and understand all of them. Let's start with one basic Russian don't. It does not matter if you want to surprise your Russian girlfriend, your business partner, or thank an old lady for her hospitality, never give an even number of flowers as a gift. Even numbers of flowers are for grieving and funerals. The florist might say something if you accidentally choose an even number of flowers but it's better if you stay alert yourself, just to be sure. Give a proper bouquet of five, seven, nine, or more flowers, depending on how much you are ready to spend, and the recipient will be more than happy. Chile. Manners matter more to the people of Chile than to other South Americans. It is extremely important not to eat anything with your fingers. Even the smallest french fry must be stabbed with a fork. Licking your fingers or utensils is also a no-go. Word to the wise, if you are planning a trip to Chile, take your time to study some etiquette rules to know your salad fork from your fish fork. Singapore Clean streets and low crime rate made Singapore famous worldwide as the fine city, and not because it is so beautiful. Remember the second meaning of the word fine? This is the case. Which means that when you enter into a new culture, you'd better get to know their customers and the taboos in case you may offend people, which may hinder the communication. Therefore, it is of vital importance to know how to say that what to say in intercultural communication. Hopefully, the study of this course will help us take a positive and understandable attitude towards other cultures, understand Chinese culture better from new perspectives, and finally, make effective intercultural communication in a global environment. Then how to study intercultural communication? In order to be successful in intercultural communication, 
we should learn about both cultural similarities and cultural differences. To some degree, it is more important to learn about cultural differences. For understanding cultural differences will help us know where communication barriers lie and how to solve these problems. In general, there are two ways to learn about target culture, intellectual approach and experiential approach. There's no doubt that for foreign language learners, the best way to learn about foreign culture is to experience it. It is only through experiencing foreign culture can we really understand the target culture and find out how native speakers use their languages. Unfortunately, many of us may not have the chance to go abroad. We can still read foreign novels or watch foreign movies. The process of understanding it is in effect a complicated intercultural communication.